And um, so I, I decided, well, it's time to write another book. And that's all there was to it. I mean, I, I had one in me, I thought. And, and I didn't know what to write about. And, um, you know, when I was at Leahy, I wanted it to be medically focused still, if I could. And when I was working at Leahy, like in, when I took the boards in 1985, a lot of questions on the boards were about Alzheimer's disease. It's always a disease of the year. And then um, AIDS was, you know, relatively um, up and coming then for a disease. But when I was leaving Leahy, hepatitis C was. So I said, well, maybe I could write about that. But, you know, it was just kind of in my head, what should I do? So one night, I just totally woke up in the middle of the night and I said, oh my God, Meg Flaherty. And Meg Flaherty is a fi fictitious name in my book, Loving Joe Gallucci, but it was a girl I went to nursing school with. And Meg Flaherty and her husband, Jimmy Romano, had this amazing relationship. I had met her at a community college when I went back to get some of my courses over with before I got my RN. And her and Jimmy had just been married and they were, relationship was up and down and fighting and this and that, but they were so in love with each other and we maintained friends. But Jimmy had gotten hepatitis C um, later on in life and ended up with a liver transplant. So I called her the next day and I said, oh, please let me write a love story about you guys. And so, you know, I had it all in my head what I was going to do and started to write an outline and they finally agreed to it, but they absolutely did not want anybody to know it's it was them. So I started the process. Here I am. I got an outline going. I went to San Diego with my husband, all enthusiastic, and we went to visit his sister. And while we were there, my husband kept getting a pain in his neck. And um, when we got home, I made him go to the doctors. And I say made because men don't go to the doctors. I mean, you have to force them. You have to, like, threaten. But he finally went, and they couldn't find anything wrong with his neck, and that pain evident, uh, eventually went away. But what they did find out is he had hepatitis C. So my m husband had hepatitis C, and here I am writing a just starting writing a book about it, so I didn't know what to do. And, you know, we waited a few weeks, and we talked about it, and he wanted me to go forth and just continue to write it. So instead of writing it just about Jimmy and Meg, I wrote about it, about my husband and I as well. So it's four people, two couples, our lives all intertwined. And it's, it's a true story. There's some fiction in it, um, but it's a true love story. And when I did get it published, I really wanted it to get out there as a love story. But for some reason, books take on lives of their own, and uh, hepatitis C became the focus. So um, for, you, for you guys who don't know what hepatitis C is, it's a virus that attacks the liver. And um, in 2003, Time Magazine called it the silent killer because it, it's attacking the liver and bloodstream, and you don't even know you have it. There's no symptoms at all. Like, my husband had absolutely no symptoms, and he got better from it with the medication. But Jimmy, his symptoms, he did get them. He started to turn jaundice, and he was too far gone. He needed a liver transplant. So, um, you know, it is, it's a really good love story, and um, <coughs> as I'm sure people in here have uh, known people with chronic illnesses or maybe have had family members. And that's what this book does show. It shows a lot of what a family goes through with a chronic illness as well. And, you know, at first there's anger and bitterness. Meg was mad at Jimmy for, he got um, the hepatitis from um, shooting heroin. And 60% um, of um, the hepatitis C people get it from um, IV drug use or snorting cocaine. The other 40% get it from um, blood transfusions before 1992 and tattoos, things like that. So, you know, in the book, it's, it's, you know, it's just a real family story and how they get mad at each other and they feel hopeless and then they find acceptance and what can we do? Their younger son, Mario, started to repeat some of his father's behavior, um, started acting out in his teenage, teenage years because he was so angry at his dad. 
his friends would come over and they'd say, um, what's the matter with your, your old man? He could, he's yellow. And they'd have to explain because my father has hepatitis C. And then they'd find out he got it from drug addiction. So it was a shame-based disease is what it is. People are afraid to say they have it because 60% of the time it's from IV drug use. A lot of baby boomers are getting diagnosed with it because in the days, back in the days, in the 60s, you know, you're at college and you decide to try um, heroin once in your life and you could have it. That actually happened to a nurse friend of mine. While I was writing this book, she, she wrote a little blurb in the book and um, she was at UMass at school. And she experimented. She said, I literally did it once. Somebody had it, and I tried it, and that was the end of it. She got a call from this guy she went to college with, and he said, you got to be tested. I have hepatitis C, and I'm really sick with it. So Lucy went and got tested, and she had it. And it was that one time, and I believe that, that it was just that one time. So, you know, it's kind of scary. But as I said, this took on a life of its own. But it is a love story, and I'm just going to read a little bit to you. This is um, when Megan Jimmy thought that he was going to um, die. And it's the beginning of December was the first snowfall, and Jimmy was now totally homebound, wheelchair-bound, only going out for doctor's appointments and an occasional dinner with Meg. He knew he was dying. No livers were available. This would be his last Christmas, if he made it to Christmas three weeks away. Meg was decorating the tree, acting normal, as if it were just another day. But they both knew that if a liver didn't become available soon, he would die. Let's talk about my death, Maggie. She was hanging tinsel and tying red bows on the tree. No, Jimmy, I'm not going there. We have to, Meg. I'm dying. I want things set at my church service, my wake and funeral. I want someone to sing Amazing Grace at the top of their lungs at my church service. Come on, Maggie, support me here. I am really dying. Jimmy's hair was thin but showed the length. His face was still so handsome amidst the swelling and jaundice. Meg put down the tinsel and bows and put her head in Jimmy's lap. The tears came. Not uncontrollable tears, but sensible tears, as Meg put it. Tears of necessity. They helped her face what she knew was inevitable. I can't let you die, Jimmy. I've never loved anyone so much in my life. I don't know if I can go on if you're not here. I loved you 30 years ago when I set eyes on you, and I love you even more now. How am I ever to get over that? Jimmy put his hand on her hair, stroking her, not responding with words, simply cause, because there was nothing to say. They had both said it all, all their lives they had loved and lost. Loved and lost a few times, but always came back because of their deep commitment. May gathered her composure and said, When my dad died in the limo, my mom looked at me and said, It's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. So I guess I need, we need to focus on that. God, Jimmy, I even love the other you, the Joe Gallucci you, and I would take Joe Gallucci back again if it meant you living. No, you wouldn't, Meg. Joe died over 15 years ago. I don't want him back again in those painful days back again. Okay, Meg said with sadness but acceptance. Tell me what you want and I'll find the courage to do it. Now and when you do die. Jimmy looked in Meg's eyes and said with strength he didn't know he had, I need to be cremated. Have my ashes sprinkled down the keys. Take me to Florida, Meg. I always loved it there. That's where I want my life to end. So Joe Gallucci, the title of that is, um, Jimmy Romano used to give that name to himself when he started to do drugs. So it was his alter ego had changed his name. And Meg, and loving Joe Gallucci, she loved him no matter what. She loved him unconditionally. So after I finished this, um, I did the same type of thing. I, um, you know, had book signings. But as I said, it took on a life of its own, and it really focused on um, the hepatitis C people. There's a hepatitis C support group, and almost every hospital in the country. It's amazing. I met so many interesting people. And one of the men I met was this doctor. He's a dentist. His name's Richard Darling. And he had three liver transplants. He, the first two failed. The third one, he had been in Vietnam and gotten injured, and he had a blood transfusion in 19, I think, 70, something like that. And so he, that's how he got his hepatitis C. But while, when he got the third liver transplant, he went into a coma. And he wrote a book called Coma Life. 
And he called it that because he could hear everything people were saying around him and he was in a coma. And so the point being, be careful what you say. <laughs> and all the proceeds of his book goes to the Fear Foundation, and, and that's uh, raising awareness on a legislative level to get more funding for hepatitis C because it's still not up there with um, AIDS. AIDS gets millions of dollars from the government for research, and hepatitis C is down there. Yet, for eight to 10,000 people die of it every year, and four million Americans have it right now. 